Welcome back to Movies TV Man and welcome to Wednesday's edition of the Movies TV Mad Daily. You can follow me on Twitter at Movies TV Mad. Right, let's get into today's edition of the Movies TV Mad Daily. The Flash movie report could hint at a major villain twist and I have opinions. Filming is currently underway on DC's long-awaited The Flash movie and snippets of information have gradually begun to come out about the project. We know the live-action blockbuster will see the return of Ezra Miller's Barry Allen The Flash as well as both Ben Affleck and Michael Keaton incarnations of Batman and the debut of Sasha Calais Supergirl. One aspect of the film that has, been, has remained a mystery, however, was the film's villain. But the new report might prove that there's more to that reveal than meets the eye. According to a new report from the Direct, the primary villain of The Flash will actually be a darker version of Barry Allen, who will also be portrayed by Miller. Uh, the irony isn't lost on me that a huge publication like ComicBook.com is quoting a smaller publication like the Direct. If this report does turn out to be true, it could add more context to some of the film's most buzzed about set photos, starting with the photos that showed Miller and the Barry Allen doppelganger standing in street clothes. While many had suspected that this might be a version of Barry from an alternate corner of the multiverse, possibly the one that Keaton's Batman hails from, the prominence of that other Barry was a mystery. There also were recent set photos of Miller filming outdoors in a largely CGI costume, which some fans initially took to mean that Barry's main costume is the film, sorry, say that again, to mean that Barry's main costume in the film would not be practical. But if this, is a, this twist is true, there's a chance the costume could be one for a dark Barry and might spoil a color scheme that would confirm that the, that the twist, if it, if it was shown in the public, Beyond just the practical evidence, a narrative argument can be also made for an alternate version of Barry being the main villain of The Flash. It's been clear that the film will draw inspiration from the Flashpoint comic event, which saw Barry accidentally creating a dark alternate reality after going back in time to pre prevent his mother's murder. This brought Eubard form reverse Flash, Barry's nemesis from the future, who was responsible for his mother's murder into the fault, only for him to reveal that Barry was the true villain behind the alternate reality. Changing Reverse Flash's role in the original comic to another version of Barry himself, a version who could very well end up being ca characterised a lot like Eubar, significantly puts the emotional onus of the story on the Flash as a character, and also leans into the novelty of seeing alternate versions of the same character which we know we're already getting in the film of Batman. It also will be clearly different the film's events from how the Flash TV series handled Flashpoint with a season long still ongoing beef between that show's version of Barry Allen, Grant Gusting and Eubard Fawn, Tom Kavanagh. While there is always a chance that this report could end up being debunked, I'm about to debunk it, <coughs> the implication of it definitely adds a compelling layer to the Flash movie as we know it. The Flash will be released in theatres on November the 4th, 2022. Right. This could be true, and this could not be true. Right. We, we have seen the same pictures, but those pictures and those videos we've seen from the location of the Flash movie are being taken out of context. Just because we saw a doppelganger walking down the street and we saw someone in Barry's costume, which was obviously Ezra Miller, it doesn't mean the main villain is going to be Ezra Miller's The Flash or another version of him. But, at the same hand, we could be looking at Savitar, because in the series, Savitar was kind of an alternate version of Barry that Barry created by accident when he was running through the Speed Force. It could be that this is the villain they're talking about, Savitar. This would make a lot of sense. And I mean, Savitar in the Flash TV series was okay, but imagine doing it with a blockbuster budget. It would be sensational. But the truth of the matter is, this character may or may not be the main villain. 
there may not be a main villain. Now, there's been a lot of conjecture about whether or not we're going to get a reverse flash in this movie. Now, I think we will. I just don't think he will play a prominent position. And that's okay, because you people are always talking about films being overstuffed and, you know, you know the DCEU rushing to do everything. But it's fine if we just see a little, no pun intended, flash appearance of Eobard Ford in the reverse flash. But I think this could be very interesting if it is Savitar. Because this would be, as the... Uh, as the lady who wrote the article said, um, this would put a deeper reflection and a deeper nuanced narrative into Barry's character, which is what we've all wanted, because one of the worries about this film is we're getting so many DC characters, we don't want Ezra Miller's character to be lost in translation, like Tom Holland's character seems to be um, in the upcoming Spider-Man No Way Home. We don't want to see that. We don't want to be excited for a film for every reason, but Ezra Miller's The Flash, which is kind of happening, and it's understandable when you're teasing all these characters from the DC Universe from different live-action iterations that are not all the DCEU. But I do think Ezra Miller is a great actor, and I think he will play a prominent role in this movie. Now, I'm fortunate enough to know enough about this movie to explain it to you in layman's terms. So, let's go from the beginning. And let's bring in Back to the Future 2, which is the best live action kind of flashpoint story we've ever seen. And I'm talking about live action, not comic books. So, in Back to the Future 2, Marty goes to the future to save his son from being put in prison. He goes there. He solves the problem with the help of Doc Brown. But he finds an almanac betting book. He decides to make a few bets that he can cash in when he goes back to the past. But he makes a mistake and old Biff steals it and gives it to young Biff. So when he goes back to 1985, Biff is all powerful in his life. And, and, and this is what happens. So in this film, and this is what I've been told is going to happen in the Flash movie. And I think I've read lots of rumours and I've put the rumours together and I've kind of binned what's not, what I believe is not going to happen and what is going to happen. So I believe this element of it, that Batfleck and Barry Allen start investigating in the present day in the DCEU because this film will continue straight after Black Adam and its central kind of narrative will be from Zack Snyder's Justice League, not Justice League. We've already discussed that Andy Machete been the idea, rejected the idea of making Justice League canon. So the canon is Zack Snyder's Justice League. I can definitely confirm that to you today. So, he decides to... Inv they, but Batfleck, Bruce Wayne, Ben Affleck, Ezra Miller's Barry Allen both investigate um, his mother's murder. Because ultimately, the ultimate goal is not just to find out who took his mother from him, but who frames his father. They don't really find any headway. So then Barry kind of, I've heard, has a little flashback from how he literally breaks his speed of light rule in the Snyder Cut. So he says to Bruce Wayne, he says, well, if I did it then, why can't I do it in a more powerful way now? Go back to the past, warn my father and my mother what's going to happen so they can take the initial precautions. So this is what Barry does. And Ben Affleck's Bruce Wayne advises him to do this, right, as well. So he does this. But he thinks, so he goes back to his present time, but it's not his present time. It's a messed up, fucked up version of Tim Burton's, Michael Keaton's um, Batman 89 universe. So he quickly finds out that he's lost his powers, that everything is different here, and there is a meta-human war. This is the central element of this movie. This is the villain of this movie. The main task for Barry Allen is to stop this meta-human war, but really, in my theory, it's a precursor to what's going to happen in this new phase of the DCEU when Barry reboots the multiverse. That meta-human war is a warning to what's going to happen in his, in his world after Flashpoint. But anyway, so I think that's what's happening. Now, as I say, I think this evil Barry probably is Savitar, and Savitar is helping the government kill metahumans. That's my theory. So, 
there is truth to this. And I said at the beginning of the, this, I will tear it down. I'm just going to tear down the simplicity of the report. Because what the direct do, they say, oh, well, yeah, this just this other version of long hair, of, you know, this other version of Ezra Miller with long hair is the main villain. And a lot of people are pissed off about this. Well, I'm not surprised. No. It goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. So my theory is that Savitar is killing metahumans for the government. In this, and he's part of this metahuman war. And he's this tool for the government. And I think this would be really, really awesome. Listen, we all want to see Reverse Flash. It isn't a necessity for me. I would love to see him. But I don't necessarily think we will see him yet. It wouldn't surprise me if they're planning a reverse, fla a reverse Flash Uabod Fawn movie, like they're doing with Black Adam. Because he's similar to Black Adam in a way, where he's a very nuanced character, and, he, in, and in some stories he's actually an anti-hero. So I think instead of just throwing him into this movie, he may cameo, which I'm fine with. But I think ultimately we may get a Uabod Fawn, maybe HBO Max movie, TV show, or maybe his own, you know, movie theatre movie you know, released it cinematically, and which I think would be a really good idea. So I'm fine with that. So that's me basically trying to explain to you what this movie is. Now, how all the parts fit into place, where the pieces of the jigsaw go in with Sasha Calais Supergirl, you know, who is she related to? Cavill's Superman, Cage's Superman, who's part of the, no um, not the Nolanverse, but the Burtonverse. Um, she, be, could, she could be connected to him. Um, but we don't know everything. And I don't think we need to know everything. There's a lot of scoops, there's a lot of leaked stuff at the moment, and we really have to be careful. I understand why the studio, studio is allowing this, it's free marketing, because they get their reaction from it, they get videos like this, and videos from prominent YouTubers who actually get viewers, unlike me. Um, so, just to repeat, what I, what, what I think about this whole thing about an evil Barry Allen being the villain of this movie, it could have a seminence of truth, but it's not just this basic long-haired Barry Allen walking around using his powers for evil. This must be Savitar. Now, now Grant Gustings and The Flash has already fought Savitar, so maybe he could be part of this. He could say to Ezra Miller's Barry Allen, listen, I've been here before, I've done this. You need my help. So maybe they'll team up, which would be really, really awesome. But yeah, I can see this evil Barry Allen being Savitar, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it a great deal because I think their ideas are good. From what I'm hearing about this film, there literally is nothing to worry about. It's okay, you know, doing this negativity dance, but at the end of the day, you know, when you've got when you've got a metahuman war in this new earth that Barry's created by accident because he goes back and warns his parents about what's going to happen, right? And then this new world is created, but this new world is a fucked up version of um, Keaton's 89 universe. How Barry gets there, I don't know. It's going to be explained when you watch the movie. You're going to have to be patient because you can't have a map of this whole movie drawn out to you. And neither should you want that to happen. But as I say, if this is Savitar, if I'm right, and Savitar is killing metahumans for the government in this metahuman war, I think this would be a very interesting take. And maybe Savitar survives to fight in the rebooted multiverse that Barry Allen, Ezra Miller reboots at the end of the Flash movie. So I think this is very, very interesting. And I'd love your thoughts on this. But that's where I'm going with this that the evil Barry Allen is in fact Savitar. And the crazy thing is, just like in the Flash TV series, it could have been someone that Barry created. Let me give you another theory. This is how Savitar could have already existed within the DCEU. Don't forget, if Barry can end up in an alternate world, so can this Savitar. You know, so he could already exist. So when Barry is breaking his number one rule, you know, travelling faster than the speed of light. In the Snyder Cut, within the Speed Force, another version of him could have been created that was burned up in the Speed Force, like this version of Barry Allen, and this Savitar version in the Arrowverse version of Savitar as well. And this is what they could be doing here. So he could already pre-exist in the DCEU. So if this is what they're doing. 
if this so-called main villain, and I don't think there are main villains, but I think I think this might be it. So I think you lot would be pretty happy if Savitar was in this movie or a DCEU version of Savitar is in this movie. And maybe this is what they mean by an evil Barry Allen. So instead of just listening to these reports, because I've tried to bring some nuance into what's going on here because I have a lot of knowledge. A lot of knowledge I will not impart to you because I don't want to ruin the film for you and some of it may be bullshit. I may not know the truth on, on some elements. So that's always important. But yeah, Savitar could have already been created in the Snyder Cut and he could have, he could have gone here as well. In fact, he could have set up this alternate Earth instead of Barry. Who knows? Savitar could be going around changing the past for the worst, like the evil Leaper in Quantum Leap. And Barry's trying to fix it as he's making it worse. So I think Savitar in the Flash movie, this is, this is the evil Barry Allen I think they're talking about. And I think this would be awesome. So that's me trying to explain what these evil Barry Allen rumours are all about. Listen, this film is basically everything that DC fans are discussing. The leaks are exciting. Uh, the Batfleck stunt double is awesome. A lot of the moving parts um, are there, but we don't really know how they're going to work out. But when I think about an evil Barry Allen, I think of Savitar straight away, and I think this is what we're going to get. And I can't wait to see if I'm right or wrong. Now, initially I told you all this would be a very quick shoot, but this is going to be a very, very long shoot with reports that Ben Affleck's The Batman will start shooting. Sorry, I'll say that again, not The Batman movie. I don't want to don't get your hopes up there, although I do see that happening. Ben Affleck's shoot on The Flash movie as Bruce Wayne and Batman well, I don't know if he's already shot some stuff, but apparently he's already done some sequences with Henry Cavill's Superman. If that's true, he's already done some stuff. But because Affleck has got so many projects, no, he's not just spending all his life with J-Lo. That's bullshit. But he's very busy. As you know, he's got multiple projects. So he did some stuff, had to go away again, and he's coming back in September to finish his shoot um, in the Flash movie. So a lot of people have been saying he hasn't got a huge role in this movie, but if he's done some scenes already and he's coming back for more, that's very, very exciting. So we started this shoot in April at some point, the beginning of April, May, June, July, we're in August now. Batflex coming back in September, that's already a five month shoot. We may be looking at here a six month shoot. This does not happen with blockbuster comic book movies anymore. It doesn't take six months to make these movies. So what does this mean? Because mostly it's three months, three and a half, four months at, at most shooting and the rest is post-production and VFX and sound effects and music, but they're shooting a lot of stuff. This would tell me not only is there so many moving parts to this film, but this could be a bloody long movie as well. You know, two and a half hours plus, which I love long movies as some of you already know. So this makes things more exciting as well and it would prove the naysayers wrong that WB just want to you know constrict all directors to two hours or just that over two hour movies this is going to be a long movie I just can't wait to see the first trailer please bring on DC fandom but more than anything else bring on whatever day it's on because I've forgotten already it's November isn't it it's just before the Aquaman Lost Kingdom movie so I can't wait to November 2022 to actually see this movie but as DC fans we have got so much to look forward to now I haven't read this article but it seems very interesting so we're going to read it together Joel Kinnaman walks us through what happened on both Suicide Squad movies by Mike Ryan from Uproxx never heard of this site before but let's give it let's give it a read I've Oh great, we've got pop-ups. Go away. I've had whole a whole career without a real smash hit. These are the words of Joel Kinnaman, who kind of surprisingly isn't wrong. It sure seems like it should be wrong. After his breakout role on The, on, on the Killing, Kinnaman has certainly been in some good movies. He's great in Run All Night, but his starring role in a Robocop reboot didn't catch on, followed by a critical bomb that, that was first The Suicide Squad, 
was first a suicide squad, well, as Kilman tells, tells it, he noticed he had to start auditioning again. This is interesting because this is what I keep on saying to everyone, and I find this so fascinating. They just called this a critical bomb. There's no such thing as a critical bomb. It doesn't matter if critics don't like your movie. The Suicide Squad made nearly 800 million. People went back and back again to watch this movie. It's the only way this movie could have made money. And by the way, Joel was amazing in that movie. Fucking amazing. Imagine how much even better he is in the air cut. So let's go back. Notice he had to start auditioning again. Although with James Gunn's The Suicide Squad not having a real smash shit, it's probably about to change. Kinnaman is an introspect introspective interview. Kinnaman is an introspective interview. There's always an honest, honestly and thoughtfulness to his answers. And it's hard not to hear the pure joy in the, ca in the candence of his voice when he talks about The Suicide Squad. That after what he went through in the first movie, also playing Rick Flagg, that he gets to now have his redemption. Even though, as he tells it, due to scheduling, he almost wasn't in this sequel. Also, what exactly did happen in the first movie? As one of only a couple of cast members to have a large part in both films, Kinnaman takes us through what happens when one movie has what he calls conflicting visions, yep, that's very true, and then another movie has one clear vision that didn't change much from the first script. About 15 minutes into The Suicide Squad, I said to myself, now we're talking. This is the one I was waiting for. Yep, it felt the same way when I saw this. I saw it in the theatre with my fiancé, and while I'm hopelessly biased, of course, I'm really not the person that you should listen to when it comes to reviewing my own films, because sometimes I fall in love with a project. But that's normal. It would be weird if you hated everything you did. Yeah, but I'm probably overcritical of my own work, but then I'm usually a little too generous to the project as a whole. Interviewer, here's what I keep thinking about. What might have been, might have been going through your head? And tell me how off base I am, because the first movie comes out, and let's be honest, people weren't into it. Something was amiss there. He replies, yeah. Again, let me say this. I enjoyed a theatrical cut. It's got a special place in my heart. And it did really, really well. Now, whether you like that movie or not, or agree with the interference of Warner Brothers, and to a point, I do agree with the interference of Warner Brothers, because they were in trouble. Their films were being destroyed by audiences, by critics, by media. They couldn't just sit there and do nothing. This was their reputation as well. And it goes deeper than just the studio interfering with a defined vision. You have to look at the people running the franchise as well. So then they hired James Gunn, and to me it almost feels like being on the basketball team in high school or something like that. And you had a pretty lousy record, so they hired a new coach. I'd be wondering if I'm still on the team. I definitely had that thought, but I knew that Rick Flagg was such an integral part of it, so it'd be hard to cut him out of it. But yeah, it's always that question. I'm wondering how he views it, how he views my character. It's going to be fun. And I also had a scheduling nightmare going into this. Oh, how so? Well, because it had been so much time between the first and the second film, this is a contractual blabber. But the, War but, but the Warner Brothers option had lapsed, so I was doing the show for Apple TV Plus for All Mankind. So because the option had left for All Mankind was in the first position. Oh, I see. And James had a very set time. At he needed to shoot this because of Guardians of the Galaxy 3. So they couldn't shift the dates at all. And the second season of All Mankind and the Suicide Squad was exactly at the same time. That they, but they made it all work, but they had to rewrite, and there were a lot of things that needed to happen for the schedule to work out. I didn't know about this scheduling conflict. A few things from the film now are starting to make sense. Things that I want to talk to you about when I do my spoiler review. There are things that I'm not happy about in terms of Rick Flagg, and I will discuss them, and I love Rick Flagg. I think he's portrayed really well in the film, but there, look, there's issues and I want to talk about them. Doesn't mean I hate the movie. Don't forget, I'm one of the biggest DC EU stands there are. I just want to talk about my issues with it when we do the spoiler review. 
I don't want to make it sound like every question I'm trashing the first movie, but I think I would feel bad for you if you didn't get to do this one after taking your lumps with the first one. Yeah, I would have been devastated, and it was so fun to get to play this version of the character as well. The first version of the character, I never really got loose in it, to be honest, and I was a bit of a, a, a plot donkey. Interesting thoughts. There are a lot of plot donkeys in the first one. When I think of the problems with the first one, you are not on the list. Okay, well, I appreciate that, but just as, as an experience, this was so much more of a creative experience for me. And it was also a little bit scarier because I was stepping into territory that I hadn't really been in, having lines that are written to be funny, and they're kind of ridiculous. It was just having to work with that kind of material and to make it seem natural and easy and not forced. It gave me a lot of respect for these comedians that make it look so easy because it's not that easy yet. I've tried comedy myself. I'm, I tell you what, I'm so much good at write, better at writing drama and performing serious drama rather than comedy. I just can't make people laugh, not in the fictional sense. And nothing against David Ayer, here we go. I like a lot of his movies. Fury is awesome. It's just they don't know what happened in that first one. But what does James say to you to have faith that whatever happened in the first movie won't happen again? I loved working with Davey as well, brilliant answer. There were parts of that process that were super memorable and, and there were parts of that process that really were instrumental in some of us bonding so deeply during the experience of the first one. But there were some conflicting visions there. I think that sometimes happens on these big movies and it can get tricky. Yeah, he's speaking fine, I think he's absolutely right. I'm glad that he calls David Ayer Davey, that means he likes the guy. I don't think anyone dislikes David Ayer. Well, maybe Margot Robbie. Is that what you think happened? Because it's such a confusing thing. And it sounds like James Gunn had a lot more freedom to do his vision. And that was part of the deal. What was so clear with James that the first script, when I got sent the first script, I was like, holy shit. First of all, I was laughing on every page. And the film is very, very close to that first vision of the script that was sent out to everyone. How rare is that with a movie of this size? It doesn't happen, it does not happen. Warner Brothers did their biggest bills they've ever done in the history of Warner Brothers. There are the biggest set bills they've ever done. It was a massive movie. It's the most expensive R-rated movie that they've ever done. And we had zero overtime and zero reshoots on this film, wow. That's unheard of, that doesn't happen. These big movies, they usually build in a three week reshoot process that comes after the first cut but there was such a clarity of vision on this film and everyone knew exactly what they were doing. Everyone knew exactly what film they were making and it just makes it for such an easy experience. How can you as an actor try to get yourself in those situations as opposed to situations where it's messy and doing reshoots and nothing seems to be in order here? How can you do that? I guess the easy answer is to work with directors who know what they're doing, but then again, David Ayer knows what he's doing. Yes, he fucking does for your information. I would love to do another movie with David as well. It's a different kind of experience and I think David is the kind of director that he also leaves a big part of the creative process to the shooting. He's also figuring out the movie that he's doing while he's shooting it. Now, this is very problematic to actors because he may be, he, he's okay improvising it, but what about the actors? The actors need to know what they're doing. There was a lot of improvisation in this movie and that's something that Jared Leto has already spoken about and I think for these big movies, you simply can't do that. If you're doing a small movie, that's great. I love improvisation as a director, writer, and an actor. But, you know, a big movie like this, where you're under pressure from the studio fans, you know, you can't do that. Well, that sounds very different than James Gunn when you say you've got this script and that's pretty much the final movie. It's the complete opposite in a way. And you can see in David's films, there are some films that he's he's made that have turned out fantastic. Oh yeah, 100%. So it's a different process and I think they're suitable for different kinds of movies. But yeah, I just do every James Gunn movie. Let's just say there's a lot of carnage at the beginning of this movie and I remember thinking, man, this might be a really short interview. <laughs> yeah, there are some people that don't make it before the title cards. The shock value that he was able to create is incredible. It just keeps you on your toes and I think it's pretty remarkable in a movie like this that it just does not feel predictable at all. You don't know who's going to make it through. Yeah, there are actual there are actual stakes in this movie, exactly. 
So how does this work? After the first movie, the reviews were banned. Were you worried at all professionally because that wasn't long after Robocop, which didn't do what it should have done? Suicide Squad seemed like a sure bet, and, the, and, and then that doesn't work. Were you worried, okay, this might be a problem? Yeah, I've had a whole career without real smash hit, but it's also made me not, me not, I don't, I don't count on one movie to change anything for me, and I don't expect any movie to do a drastic change. The way that I look at it, I keep my head down, and I focus on the craft, and then the career will come. There have been periods in my career where, after Robocop, for example, it didn't bomb, it had, it made money, but it took a couple of years for it to make money. It sort of broke even. Right, and there wasn't a sequel exactly yet. It wasn't a hit. Then it was slightly, then a little slight. All of a sudden, I had to audition again. And I'm okay with that. I don't take anything for granted, and I feel increasingly blessed to just be in this position, to do this for a living. So for me, I sort of detach myself from expectation on, on the performance of any given project that I do. Of course you try to pick projects that are going to be successful, but I try to focus on the craft and focus on doing characters that I find interesting. And where I feel like I'm challenging myself, I can do something that I haven't done before. I focus on trying to get better at my craft and doing going deeper into characters. So far, it's worked. I keep getting interesting things coming my way. Sometimes I have to fight for it. Sometimes it comes my way. Well, see, there was a time when I got stressed, when I felt like, ah, oh, I'm not making it to the pinnacle. That's my goal, to get to the pinnacle, where you have all the option. There is a creative reason to strive to have more success in this business. Sure. And to become a bigger star because then you get the opportunity to work with the most interesting directors. You get the best scripts sent you. But I just take it as it comes. I try to make interesting choices and do as deep of a performance as I can. I always try to work hard and then I think it's a bit of luck. You have to have a little luck as well. Speaking of luck, not many movies do what the first movie did, then get a sequel. That we got... That we got a guy like James to come in and do this because of his unfortunate situation or how people rea reacted at Disney at the time and it became our fortune and we were so fortunate to get him to, to this. I'm so happy because it feels like the first movie was a little bit of a strain and this completely just, it's going to change how people view this whole franchise. Oh, no question. It's going to completely wash that away and it's going to make something that I kind of look at as, oh well, you win some, you lose some. And then now it's transformed into something that I'm all uber proud of. Yeah, this movie isn't a, a, isn't a win, some lose some. Yeah, this movie isn't a win, some lose some situation. I would love just to go back and do another movie with James right away, just because I think he's so damn good. He brought out a different side of me that I'm now determined to keep working on and finding things a little bit more in a humorous space. I'd really like to go and do a comedy, and our process in this film, I told them straight up, don't be shy with me, work with me on this, and work with my timing and delivery, because even big directors that can get a take, then they don't want to work too hard on everything, because they are afraid that maybe the actor's confidence will be affected, or it will be a bad vibe, and I told them straight up, I want to... So I want to see this as a workshop as well, and I want to get better at this, so just work with me on this, and let's really get to the bottom of it, great attitude, and he did. So we had a great relationship where I felt really uh, learned a lot in the space, and with this kind of tone, so I'm looking forward to working more on that. Yeah, a really, really good interview, there's lots, look, there's lots of things here, people will keep on talking about the critical reaction of the Suicide Squad, and look, as Joel, Joel says himself, it was a mixture of visions. That's a polite way of saying that David had his vision and the studio had theirs. As I said earlier on, I don't blame the studio, I don't blame David. But this is the problem with bringing in someone who wants to make it up as he goes along. That's what David wanted to do. You can even tell there from what Joel's saying. And look, it's problematic. As I say, on indie movies, it's great. But on a movie of this size that's got so much depend on, depending on it, you simply can't do that, and this was part of the problem. But I love Joel's attitude that he told James, you know, workshop with me, I want to improve, I want, I want you to make the best shots with me, I want to learn how to do humour, and that's fantastic. And we will talk about Joel Kinnaman and Rick Flagg on my spoiler review. Oh yes, I've got a lot to say on that one.
Wow, Grace Randolph really does get herself involved and she's not as smart as she thinks she is. So this morning, early this morning, a fellow nerd DM me, slided in my DMs and started telling me about a situation with Grace Randolph. So I want to get my facts straight here. Now this start because basically Grace Randolph and James Gunn had a bit of beef with each other. Don't forget the director of Birds of Prey, Kathy Yang, exposed her on Twitter a couple of years ago. It was fucking hilarious. But she will not leave it alone. This woman cannot help herself. Anyway, this is how it all started. So James Gunn, basically, um, a few years back, Kevin Feige said that the MCE was going to space and um, James Gunn had said, um, he was explaining how he didn't want, he didn't think it was important, he didn't want Thanos in it. It wasn't that he didn't want Thanos, wasn't interested in Thanos, but that wasn't the story he was, he was going to tell. Grace Randolph decided to go and many, many um, other journalists decided to say he wasn't interested in telling Thanos' story which was simply wasn't true. Now, this is what James Gunn said this back on the 14th of April, 2017. And furthermore, of all the journalists I've called out on making up info or misquoting me, Grace Randolph is the only one not to respond. I didn't know anything about this, by the way. Either that or I forgot about this. James Gunn, it may serve your story at Grace Randolph, but I never said I didn't find Thanos interesting. I said I wasn't inspired to put him in my film. So it's kind of tomato, tomato. But, but at, the end, uh, at the end of the day, right, Gunn didn't like what journalists were saying, and I don't think Fag liked. Sometimes James talks too much and he gets himself in a ditch. But I can understand why he was pissed off. Look, and at the end of the day, he explains himself and he expects to get a reaction from the other journalist. Say, you know, James, sorry, we got the wrong end of the stick. He got nothing back from her. So, so then Grace Randolph tweets out a YouTube video. So Kevin Feig, Feig says the MCU is going to space, as is the DCEU. And it seems James Gunn is leading the way. Is the DCEU going to space? Well, it will eventually. Um, but anyway, this was a few years back. So anyway, he didn't like that she didn't respond to him. So there's a bit of beef between these two. So I'm just going through these DMs. I'm not going to mention who tweeted me this, just in case this person doesn't want me to identify him or her. So, then we get this from the Harley Quinn account. Harley Quinn, okay, I'm going to warn you guys. If you're following Grace Randolph, please be aware she's tweeting spoilers and is posting spoilers about each of the characters in the Suicide Squad. Just a warning to anyone who's following her. What happens afterwards at Harley Quinn gets blocked by Grace Randolph. Wow, just wow, Harley Quinn says. Well, not the real Harley Quinn. Seems like every time something good happens for DC, she's always there to torpedo it with her voice and popularity. She's not that popular, mate. Obviously more popular than me, but anyone's more popular than me. She's so obsessed with Marvel, it's disgusting. So this is this person talking to me. Now, this is interesting. She's playing the victim now, saying she doesn't feel comfortable putting a review on Rotten Tomatoes. So, look, it's obvious she's going to put a shitty review about the Suicide Squad on Rotten Tomatoes. Of course she feels comfortable. She's going to love this because everyone's going to start streaming to her platform, aren't they? That's exactly what she will do. She's mad still that Gunn caught her out on her lies, yep. And now she's going to try torpedoing, he, torpedoing, torpedoing his movie any, and any DC movie. She never posts spoilers for Marvel content. Tells you whose side she's on. She ain't no, she ain't no DC fan. I remember she even, even tried selling to her viewers that The Great Reviews is not a win for DC, but instead critics trying to rally behind Gunn. What a bitch. Every fan out there that's seen it are in love with this movie, and they are blown away. Right. Let's, let's, let's look at what she said, because I haven't seen one of her videos for ages, and I, she, I'm also blocked from her since her reaction to David Ayer's 2016 movie, although it's not David's movie. Apologies, David. So we had a little row, and she blocked me. Um, I wasn't rude, I didn't swear at her, I didn't threaten her, but she didn't like the fact that I was disagreeing with her. Anyway, 
So this, so basically, she's claiming um, that all the critics are just rallying, um, you know, rallying behind James, you know, and and not they're not doing it for DC. That's immaterial, Grace, because this is a DC and WBIP. So anything nice that the audiences say and critics say is a good thing for DC and WB, and it doesn't matter if they're doing it to get behind James Gunn. It doesn't matter about the critics' motivation. If audiences, and we know lots of audiences who have already seen it in the UK are loving it, and um, the critics are giving it high scores on the metrics, it means it's good for WB. It means it's good for DC. What you're saying, Grace, is immaterial. But this goes beyond her beef with James Gunn. I mean, it's disgusting to start posting spoilers as well. But this is, she's not, look, she's not a very nice person. That's obvious. Um, she's like Marmite, I've told you before. Sometimes I love her, sometimes she winds me up. It's just the kind of person she is. She does know a lot about DC. She's a big Batman fan, and I, I believe that she is a Batman fan in my personal opinion. Here's the problem. She's very integrally linked with Zack Snyder. You know, um, she's given, he's given her a lot of interviews on her channel. It's been great for her. So she is a bit of a Snyder stan, and she will do anything like these other Snyder stands to take down this film. Here's the problem. She's quite popular. I'll correct myself on that. But she's not popular enough to take down this movie. But let me be clear, because the box office results from London in the past four or five days have been great. But that doesn't tell the full story yet. Because this film will release on Friday globally. When we get the weekend opening box office reports for James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, this is when we're going to know chapter one if it's successful. Chapter one is the opening. He needs a huge opening because this is probably the most, as Joel Kinnaman said, this is the most expensive R-rated movie probably ever made or one of them. So this movie needs to make back a hell of a lot of money and COVID can no longer be an excuse. There's enough movie theatres out there and you can't use the HBO Max thing as an excuse either. If people want to go and see it, if they're that motivated, they'll go. And if it's that good a movie, they'll go back and watch it. This is my argument about Black Widow. The movie dropped off in its second week because it had zero rewatchability, -watch, re and that's a fact. This film has rewatchability because I've seen it and I'm going to go back and rewatch it this Friday and after that at some point I will do my spoiler review and I'm very excited to do that with you and for you. Uh, very excited. Uh, but I need to watch the film at least twice to get everything straight in my mind because I don't write notes, that's not how I do it. Because uh, I can't enjoy a movie while I'm writing notes. It's, it just takes the excitement. You're just looking down and missing stuff, aren't you? Um, so Grace Randolph is attempting to bring this film down, uh, partly because she's got issues with with James Gunn, and partly because she wants to restore the Snyderverse as well. But it's not going to work. She can't take the movie down. The only thing that can take the movie down is if this movie doesn't do well in the box office. I have no idea how much this movie is going to do in the box office. There are some people saying around 28 to 30 million. That simply isn't good enough. I can't even tell you that that's good enough. Now, I, don't, I can't see a world where that's a reality, but I could be wrong. This film, listen, this film needs to make between 40 and 45 million on its opening weekend, at least. Anything else would be a major disappointment. But let me be clear, this is one of the finest comic book movies ever made. One of them. Not the best, not even in my top three in, in my new revised DCEU rankings, but... It's a really, really good film. So this film needs to be aiming from about 40, I think, I think around 38 to 45 is a solid result and everyone should be happy. But 28 to 30, no, that's a failure. It simply can't make that. And it also needs a, it needs a strong remaining three weeks after that as well. So we will see what happens there. But that's Grace Randolph trying to torpedo James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. And I'm sorry, Grace, my dear, you just simply don't have the power to do it. This has been Wednesday's edition of the Movies TV Man Daily. I'm Mick, your host with the most. Just ask your girlfriends and your wives. Follow me on Twitter, at Movies TV Man, and I will see you again in the next video. Until then, goodbye.